Hello, everybody. Hi, council member. Thanks for getting right on that situation today. Thank you so much. You are happy to. Thank you for uh, reaching out. Hey, that's what we do, right? <laughs> it is. Yep. Yep. Great teamwork today. You turn my mic on yet. Can anyone from council hear me? Any council yes. members? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. We're going to get started in a, about 30 seconds. Okay. Good evening, everyone. This is the first meeting of City Council's redistricting committee. I am Trippy Congo, president of City Council and also chair of the redistricting committee. First, I'd like to do a roll call of everyone who is on the redistricting committee. Council Member Darby. Present. Council Member Oliver, Committee Member Oliver. Present. 
Committee, committee member Harley. Present. Committee member Cabrera. I believe she was having some technical difficulties earlier. Committee member Dixon. Present. Committee member Spadola. Here. And I'll circle back to uh, Cabrera. Present. Okay. Also, at this time, I would like to acknowledge any other council members who are present. Uh, council member Gray. Council member Fields. Present. Council member McCoy. Council member Johnson. Council member Field. And council member Walsh. Council member McCoy. Present. All right, and I'll circle back to council member Gray. Council member Johnson. Council member Field and council member Walsh. All right, I would like to also thank everyone from the public who has joined this evening, th this evening from uh, right here in council chambers and also virtually. Also like to uh, acknowledge other panelists who are in attendance this evening. Daniel Walker, our chief of staff for city council, Marshall Bassanite, our senior legislative advisor, Bob Goff, City Solicitor, Zach Storapo, Assistant City Solicitor, Matt Harris, Senior from Planning, Anthony Albans, State Election Commissioner, Chris Ramos, Director of IT, Tracy Dixon, County Director, Department of Elections, David Jowski, please uh, forgive me if I don't get your, your name correct. The Deputy Everyone County does. Director for Newcastle County. Kyra Hoffner, League of Women Voters. John Sebastian, Deputy Bureau, Chief Department of Corrections. So as all of you know, most of you may know, every 10 years a census is taken of the population of the United States. This is for all level of governments from the federal level to the state and county level, including the local level. When, when the census occurs, one of the things that governments must look at is whether or not district boundaries for council districts needs to be redrawn because of shifts in the population, which is referred to as redistricting. Per city code section 232, the redistricting committee is comprised of the president of council and six members appointed by the president of council. On July 21st, 2021, the, fo the following council members were appointed to the redistricting committee. Uh, Shanae Darby from the second district, Xanthia Oliver from the third district, Michelle Harley from the fourth district, Maria Cabrera, Rashima Dixon, and James Padola at large, council members. This process is mandated in the city code. And tonight we have a, a robust agenda but Ms. Bassanite will share with us the redistricting process and our responsibilities. But first, I highly encourage all council to participate in this process, regardless if you are a committee member or not. I also strongly encourage the community to participate. For transparency, all of the meetings will be done in the public and that there will not be any executive sessions of any of these meetings. All maps and information will be made accessible to the public by the City Council's website at www.wilmingtoncitycouncil.com, as well as this information will be available in the City Council office. This initial meeting today will focus primarily on the process, where upcoming meetings will focus on the data, demographics, maps, etc. There will also be an opportunity for anyone from the public uh, whether you are virtual or in council chambers, to give comment towards the end of the meeting. Ms. Bassanite, can you please walk us through this redistricting process and the responsibilities of this committee? 
Yes. Um, before I begin, I saw that um, Councilman Spadola had his hand up. Okay, Councilman you. Spadola, do you have a comment? Thank you, Council President. We're getting a, a bit of an echo from your mic. I just put it in the chat. So I put my hand down, but uh, if WYTN could help out with that, that'd be appreciated. Yes, that's something that we that we had to deal with last week. Also, right now they they are not able to um, do too much with the echo, but they are going to try to work on it in the future. But, but thank you. Okay, um, as President Congo stated, per City Charter Section Two One Hundred Two. When it comes to formulating the redistricting plan, um, the city council's redistricting committee is comprised of the president of council and six members appointed by the president of council. And the committee shall convene on uh, before July the 1st. Um, if I can have WITN, if you can put up the presentation so the public can see, please. Next slide. Um, so the July 1st date is, is highlighted here. And I just want to, to mention is um, <clears throat> the committee did not convene by July the 1st, but um, the significance regarding that is that we did not receive the data until August the 12th. So in consultation with the law department, um, it was just shared that we are with us meeting today, August the 25th, that July 1st date really didn't <clears throat> pertain to us since we didn't have the data prior to that July 1st date. Um, next slide, please. Uh, once again, um, as far as the time, lane, time frame, which is in the code in the charter, it is the mandatory duty of council to redistrict the city within six months after we receive the census data. So as I stated previously, we received the state of Delaware, we received the census data from the state of Delaware on August the 12th. And I apologize, there's a typo there, it's August 12th of 21, not 2011. Um, so council must complete the redistricting process no later than February 3rd of 2022. So that's the absolute latest. Um, that is the first meeting in February. Um, I assume council wouldn't want to wait until the absolute deadline, but I just wanted just to um, highlight that and bring that to the forefront for the committee to say. Okay. Within the next slide, it talks about the eight districts. Okay. Um, when we're looking at the eight district, we want to have an ideal number of the population for each, di each district. So how that is determined is you take the total population and you divide it by eight. So based upon the census population for 2020, um, the total population for Wilmington is 70,898. Next slide. Michelle, could you speak up please? I'm sorry. Could you speak up? Next, thank you. I think they would have to turn the mic up. When is my mic on loud, loud enough? Okay, so once again, the city population is 70,898. You take the 70,898 and you divide it by eight. Um, the ideal um, list, district list would be 8,862, okay? The key thing with the code as it's highlighted above is we wanna try to get as close as possible as the same number of um, persons within each district. But um, what's key here in this, Underline is um, with no aggregate diversion in population more than 10% from the average population. So next slide, please. So 10% um, is the required ba balance, which we do, which is per the city code charter. Um, it has been recommended based upon previous processes that was done um, with the census in 2000, as well as what was done in 2010 that a district population cannot be more than 5% smaller or 5% larger than the ideal district. So those numbers listed there in parentheses are um, the numbers that would be um, recommended for per district. Next slide, please. One of the key things that the committee would have to do is submit a committee report. 
Okay, the committee report is submitted and filed with the city clerk, and that committee report is actually an ordinance. The report of the committee it shall include a map and a description of each of the council managed districts. Um, that is in the form of a proposed ordinance. Um, and once again, um, the law department works with formulating the ordinance with this redistricting committee. Next slide, please. One of the main things is um, this council wants to be very transparent. Um, and per the city code, there is public involvement in this process. Per the city code, the committee shall conduct at least one public hearing, which would have to be advertised. Uh, more than likely, um, in discussion with the committee, we might want to do more than one public hearing. Um, that will be up to you to decide. And once again, the public is given opportunity um, to talk within this process. Um, as the uh, president mentioned in his opening and comments, none of these meetings will be in the executive session. Per the city charter section 2102, there is a time frame that this redistricting must be done by. If it's not done within um, the time frame specified within that six month time frame, council shall not receive any further salaries. And that's per the city code. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks is February 3rd, 2022 will be the last possible date for the council meeting for the redistricting to occur for third and final. Next slide, please. When it comes to redistricting committee, as far as staffing, the committee does have the um, capability if it chooses to, if they'd like to have um, consultants to assist with this redistricting process. We also have um, a representative assigned from the law department to assist with the process. And we also have a representative from um, the planning department. So if we go to the next um, slide, we also have our chief of staff, um, Daniel Walker, as well as myself that will be assisting this committee with this process. Just uh, quickly, Marshall, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I see that Christopher has his hand up. I'm not sure, I think he's one of the, the panelists. I'm not sure if he has a question. Um, Chris, did you have a question, Chris, Chris Ramos? Ramos? Uh, I do not, I apologize for that. Okay. Okay, all right, thank you. Thanks. So some dates has been established for the upcoming redistricting committee dates. Um, and this information is also on our council website. So of course we have one today, we're trying to schedule them monthly. There's the next scheduled one will be September the 23rd, October the 28th and November the 22nd. Um, those meetings will be at five o'clock PM. Um, it will be virtual what the meetings will actually be hybrid, no different than what we're doing today. Uh, one other thing that I would like to mention is we do have a dedicated page on our council website for redistricting because we wanna make sure that the public has the ability to retrieve any of the information. So the information will be on the council website as well as any information will also be available um, in our city council office. Um, on the next slide, um, this here was um, demographics that was done from um, the last census that was done. I know it's kind of difficult um, to read these numbers from the public, but just wanted to put this in here so we have something just to look from um, so that if the public does have a hard copy, they can be able to see, the, see those numbers that was done with the last census. And um, if you go to the next slide, um, these here are the new numbers. Um, as I mentioned, our total population is 70,898. Um, if you go to the far left corner, um, it's labeled inca incarcerated. So those are the number of people for incarceration per district. I just wanna state that those total numbers is not counted in the total number for the 70,898. Um, we will have um, John Sebastian on um, and he can talk 
um, with the committee um, a little bit more about how those numbers were derived. But I just, just want to mention that um, these here were the numbers we um, just wanted to share this information since we just um, received this um, yesterday. And um, President, before we move on, I just want to um, thank both um, Anthony and Chris because they worked very diligently to be able to get um, data to us, um, as well as um, maps, which we received all the information like today. And I know they just received the information from MAP the two. So I just want to um, acknowledge them that we do um, appreciate what they have done for this committee. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bass Knight. Next on the agenda is the state census and Mathitude software overview by State Elections Commissioner Anthony Albans. I'm coming in. Oh, there we go. Very good. Sorry about that. I had a little video interruption. Here. Thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate it. Um, and and uh, thank you, Marshall, very much for your kind words for us and our team. It's our, our pleasure. Um, and I just have a few remarks I wanted to, to share tonight. Um, uh, as Marshall mentioned, um, we have been uh, working together with um, some initial uh, kind of groundwork for um, for this purpose. You know, I just always like to state at the, at the outset um, for the benefit of the commission and certainly for the public as well. Um, anytime there is, uh, you know, redistricting uh, comes up, and I know Marshall provided the code citations, um, certainly the body, uh, in this case, the Committee of City Council, of course, is charged with the redistricting. We are here, if it is the committee's pleasure, uh, to work with us um, at, in a technical support capacity. You know, certainly that's the committee's prerogative if, if you wish to work with the department. And if you do, we're certainly happy you know, to do so. But we always like to be very clear at the outset, of course, you as the appointed and elected and appointed um, individuals for this committee ultimately, of course, make the decisions and we follow you know, any direction that you provide to us and we are here to provide support. Um, Marshall did share some questions with me um, to kind of guide uh, what I would share with you tonight. So I, I figured I would just go through those um, and, and briefly provide a recap. Um, as I mentioned, our area of support um, uh, would be the provision of, of the data that we receive um, from the census. You know, as Marshall mentioned, the census, of course, released the data to the state. And um, we uh, utilize a program, which I'll get into in a moment, um, that helps us to ingest and uh, analyze and assign those, that data uh, consistent with uh, existing districts, in this case, city council districts, and analyze uh, where we are in terms of deviation as it stands with current population based on uh, what the ideal you know, district would be. Um, again, we, are, we do provide uh, support uh, if that is your, you know, your, your preference, and we'll be happy to do anything that we can. Uh, one of the questions Marshall asked us to answer was uh, kind of our history here. Uh, to my knowledge, and my, we have been involved with the last two redistrictings with the city providing support. And we also, um, at the request of Newcastle County Council, they have a redistricting commission. That's how their process is um, articulated in state code. Uh, we're providing support to them as well as the city of Newark who also has a redistricting process as well. Um, and uh, so those are some of the other, uh, some of our other uh, colleagues, if you will, throughout the state that we're working with. Um, Marcelle also asked me to cover a bit about turnaround time. Uh, again, you know, we did get the data, well, everyone certainly nationally got the data uh, later than originally, you know, uh, expected. Um, and in terms of turnaround time, we will certainly do our very best um, you know, Chris is one of our colleagues on the line, um, uh, who is our director of information technology, uh, as well as our county director and deputy director from Newcastle County office. Uh, we'll be happy to all work together, turn around the data, turn around the proposed changes for districts that the committee uh, wishes to uh, explore um, as quickly as we possibly can. And again, we'll certainly take our direction from, from you. Um, and that would entail uh, primarily after you analyze uh, the initial data, that would be provision of draft updated maps that would show possible scenarios, possible uh, district configurations, district lines, taking into account those population changes before the committee ultimately settles on a plan you adopt. 
Um, Marcel also asked me to go into a little bit about the functionalities of the Maptitude software. So, um, and, and I you know, certainly at any point I may call uh, on, on Chris, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, to also jump in my IT director for elections, our, our team. Um, but just in, in basic terms, Maptitude is a uh, software program. It's something that we've utilized for a few election cycles here with the Department of Elections. And also it's utilized by the General Assembly um, at the state level. What it does, what its purpose is basically it, it ingests, if you will, the census population raw data that's provided by the Census Bureau and assigns those population numbers to census blocks. Um, the census basically, as many of you may know, the census block is kind of the smallest level of organization of the census. And that takes into account basically kind of contiguous, uh, very small areas or contiguous parts of communities, if you will. So the software will assign those numbers to census blocks and then allows us to display that information as it relates to, in this case, current city council boundaries. Um, so for example, the maps um, that we were literally just able to produce today um, and Marshall had picked up from our office and would provide to the committee, they will show you graphically basically what those charts showed you earlier, um, how the population lays out in each district. And again, the charts show you generally the deviation from what would be an ideal district based on the, the new census count. So in short, the software ingests the software, excuse me, ingests the data, helps us to produce a graphical representation of it, as well as maps and other uh, tools to help us visualize what the data looks like in real terms. And then for the redistricting process, the software will allow uh, the committee, you know, directing us to again, draw, move some lines, include or exclude census blocks from districts, current districts, as you begin to vision what future district lines may look like and ultimately for you to arrive at a plan. It's um, a very great tool. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very sophisticated, very powerful tool. Um, the advantage, if you choose, if, you know, if you, if you wish to continue to work with the department on this, uh, the advantage would be uh, to you, to the committee, is that we already own the software, we own the license to the software, we own the hardware to run the software, and we have the staff, um, predominantly Chris, who is trained on how to use the software, and he's a real expert on it. Um, Chris, if I may call on you for a moment, is there anything you'd like to add to my description? Is there anything that I left out? Hey, Anthony, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure you sounded like you're the expert, I'm, and I'm not. <laughs> I doubt so, it. Uh, so you pretty much captured everything. Um, okay. In short, it's simply a tool to facilitate redistricting. Um, it gives you information on uh, demographics as you move those lines, whether or not you, you need those demographics in order to make your decisions on which line goes to which. Um, it's entirely up to you. It's simply a tool. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, one quick item on that, um, just very quickly, I'll wrap up this section of the, the questions and answers. Um, Marcel also asked me to speak a little bit about um, the interactivity component of the software. Um, the software is interactive um, in the sense that, um, you know, one individual is actually controlling the software, if you will, and perhaps changing the lines and visioning what different districts would look like. It is interactive in the sense that we could, we certainly have the capability for um, over a setting like this, perhaps if, you know, uh, to, to uh, project um, this, the software, project the image onto a screen. So you could see, um, for example, those uh, a map on the screen, you know, at a, at a very large, uh, display size, their you know, resolution can be a little bit less than ideal, but it's certainly, you know, very workable, certainly. Um, and also any limitations uh, was another question posed. Um, not really. I don't see any. It's it, We've used it for a few cycles now. It works really, really well. Uh, the really key advantage is that um, one of the key advantages is that, as I mentioned, the General Assembly uses this as well. So we're all on the same platform because as you, you know, as you mentioned, Mr. President, earlier, all the 
uh, jurisdictions, all the legislative bodies are doing redistricting, state house, state senate, county council, the city, all these have to interact and ultimately overlay each other. So using that, this software for all of them, you know, really makes it, you know, certainly much easier uh, in that regard. Um, basically, a uh, couple more questions and then I'll be, I will be finished with the uh, kind of prepared comments here is, um, uh, Marshall asked me to address are there any considerations that the committee should be thinking about and potentially collaborating with us. Um, just I'll reiterate that the main consideration uh, is that all the decisions on the line, drawing of the lines, any changes are, are, are in the um, purview, of course, of the committee. We just offer support and we will follow your lead on that. Um, and I, I shared something, um, uh, one of many resources out there, you know, again, we're totally nonpartisan in our role, but I shared with Marshall um, that there is a salt, there is a, um, a resource out there, one of many, certainly, but the National Conference on State Legislatures, NCSL, uh, which is a great resource that certainly we use in the elections field quite a bit. They have a whole page and a whole resource center on redistricting that has kind of some best practices and case studies and things of that nature um, that you might find helpful and the committee might find helpful. So um, that's all I have in terms of a prepared, you know, remark, certainly. And um, I'd you know, certainly be happy if there's any questions. Okay. Yes. Thank you, gentlemen. Councilwoman Darby does have a question. Can we remember Darby? Yes. Um, thank you, Council President. Um, good evening, Commissioner. Um, there was a, a comment made that lines are drawn, that it's drawn based on current lines. And I wanna make sure that that isn't like a requirement that um, the current district lines, we begin with that when we're doing the redistricting process because my concern is um, that redistricting shouldn't protect incumbents um, mm -hmm. with current lines and, and, and like they do that, right? Um, so like, how are we making sure that we're doing this without starting off with the current lines, which is doing what's best based on whatever the data gives us? Um, basically, oh, just on your question, council member, um, what I was mentioning on that was just that the, the current map, whenever there's a redistricting process in any jurisdiction, usually the, the current map is just the starting point, you know, and then you work from there just because that's what's existing, which, what the council adopted previously. So you just have to kind of start somewhere, not say, I wasn't saying, I didn't want to give the impression that anything had to be preserved. Again, that's your prerogative, of course, but just that's kind of where we start. And those initial maps that we provided show you the population based on the current lines since they're in effect. We're, really, the main point there is just to talk about the population deviation, how, how much, like, for example, a district may be above or below the ideal count that was mentioned earlier. So, but yeah, it's completely up to you how you, do, how you uh, assign the lines completely, of course. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Can I ask another question, Council President? Yes. Yes. Is there like a setting or features to be able to input um, when designing the new lines for it to not happen on like certain streets or to not happen? Like, I don't believe we should be dividing communities by highways. So like making sure that we're not using highways or that we're not using um incumbent addresses, like making sure that we're not using certain things. Are we able to put in like some things that, you know, like, I don't even know what to call it, but like mm. think like codes to follow to make sure those lines don't happen like that. Mm. Um, I would, I might ask Chris to come in on this too um, from our team, but there is, um, I mean, the way the census blocks are drawn, those individual components that make up the districts, the way the census draws those is they do try to, keep together contiguous communities or communities of interest that are communities that have a relationship to each other, like a neighborhood or, or a significant part of a neighborhood. There, there's, I'm not aware of like an automatic kind of setting. That would probably be something that uh, as you and the other members look at the maps, you know, you, the, the actual features are you know, can be shown on the maps. So you can see like how everything inter interconnects. So you, as you begin to look at, oh, hey, what if we draw a line here? you know, you can see kind of what that potentially impacts. So, but yeah, that goes back to kind of being the interactive product that you really can see in real time what things look like, where the lines fall, like on the actual geography, streets, boundaries, neighborhoods, whatever that may be. All right, perfect, thank you. And when counting incarcerated people too, is that factored into 
um, the numbers once we put them in. Um, and I know, um, to your question, I know that uh, John Sebastian from Department of Corrections is also on the agenda a little later. Um, the list, uh, the chart that we provided earlier that was in the presentation, those uh, n individuals who are incarcerated, those numbers are not included in the poor census numbers. They're in addition to that. So they would have to be factored in and that would be part of the calculation of the ideal district size. So that, that would be added in because that, that is outside of the actual census count numbers. Any other follow-up, committee member Darby? No, I'm good for now. I have questions for later. All right, council, committee member Harley, did you have, any, did you have a question? Yes, thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, um, gentlemen, um, and those of you that have prepared this information. Um, very clear, very thorough. Um, and the way that I'm interpreting um, your information is that um, with the software that you are um, just um, sharing with us, the software that you're sharing with us, you, you just give some ideals in terms of what it could possibly look like, starting with where the lines are drawn currently right now. And with the software, it um, actually gives us suggestions and ideals and of course, we have the last say in terms of, oh, that makes sense or that doesn't make sense. So that's my question. Does the software um, help us to look at what makes sense and what seems to you know, work together and et cetera, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, the software would help help you in that regard just because it's the, in the sense that it's very visual. So you can literally see if you're sitting down or, or, or the committee as a whole is sitting down and deciding, okay, I wanna move this line from street A to street B, I just use that as an example. You know, you can literally see re in real time how that affects not just the shape of the district, but the population. You, you can see it actually, it, it, part of that interactivity, you can see the numbers going up and down. How far are you away from your ideal number? And then look at it visually, like, okay, where is that impacting? What street, what neighborhood, what natural boundary, that sort of thing. And um, just part of your question, uh, Councilmember Harley, is that on um, on the uh, the process itself, uh, the way that our department uh, works in terms of the support is it is as I mentioned completely in your hands. So we won't even make any suggestions. It, we're really totally a support role. Uh, we will completely, even if you look at different scenarios, let's say down the line, it would be completely at your direction or the committee's direction or, you know, whomever from the committee uh, asks us to do that. You know, and we can draw various scenarios. If you, you know, if you want to look at a couple different um, options, for example, for a district or two adjoining districts, let's say, there's a lot of flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, I have a follow-up, Mr. President. Okay. Yeah, so that's pretty much was what I was trying to understand mm -hmm. um, as it relates to how we are, structured right now, you know, we, you have a number of new council members that are on this committee. So I'm thinking um, having the guidance of, of example A, B, C, it could look like this, it could look like that. And I, and I'm, I clearly hear what you're saying that um, you're following our lead. Mm -hmm. I get that. But um, if, if we decide that we want you to provide some of those types of examples, you're saying that you will be more than willing to do that with your software and your team. If I, for example, said, hey, you know, um, I would like to see, you know, what would you come up with based on your experience, based on your history, your department? Um, what does, what can you show me one, two, three, four examples? That, that's my question. <laughs> Uh, we could do that, but we, we would do that. Uh, certainly, we would do that at the, your direction com completely. Yeah, we would not. Uh, ours of practice, we don't draw up uh, like uh, scenarios on our own. We would to totally want to be guided by whomever, by yourself or other members looking at uh, the process. Because we just want to make sure that we are always completely non-biased, non-partisan in this com at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, committee member Harley. Uh, committee member Oliver, yes, do you have a question? Thank, yeah, thank you, Mr. President. I was trying to, uh, I thought I heard, I, um, 
the clarity that um, Anthony or whoever spoke in front of me said that, you know, they're going to give us some sample maps and we do have a support system from the law department here if we had any questions and um, and we also um, had uh, another support person uh, as we get into this a little deeper. So it's not like we're just out there on our own. So we do have some support. Is that true? Uh, you certainly have our support, you know, right. at, at your right. direction, whatever you whatever you need. And I know you have resources on the city you know, side right. as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I just didn't, I didn't want the public to think that we're just out here by ourselves. We have right. a lot of support. Right. Uh, as this process goes on. Thank you. Right. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Committee member Spadola. Thank you, council president. I have two questions if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, Mr. Albans, thanks for your time tonight. Uh, pra very practically speaking, uh, in terms of magnitude drawing up uh, different scenarios, is this, a, is it as simple as me emailing you or members of the committee emailing you saying, Hey, what, it, what about this? Scenario A, can you draw something up for this? Scenario B, and so on. Uh, you could, certainly could do that. Um, that would be one approach. Uh, you know, I don't know. Again, it really is up to the committee's prerogative how coordinated you want it to to be. In the sense that, you know, ultimately, of course, the plan will all have to agree. You know, across all districts. So um, I think that's a balance in some respects. You know, in terms of the. Individ looking at individual districts, because of course, as soon as you change anything, obviously it impacts the adjacent districts and then the, 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 the city as a whole. Yeah, so, I, I mean, for the yeah. entire, for the right, entire. Right, right, yeah, exactly, exactly. So as much coordination, I guess, would be would be ideal for us because then that'll help kind of the efficiency of looking at the any drafts that we produce. Okay, mm -hmm. and is there any opportunity for the public to, uh, to use Maptitude? Um, uh, if it's the, if the committee wants to have, um, you know, opportunity for public input, you know, like I mentioned in a virtual setting like this, we can provide, we can show Maptitude. It's not necessarily ideal to do it, um, live, if you will, but, you know, be, just because of, it can be a little bit of, um, right. lag time, kind of time consuming, um, in terms of like the minutia of drawing it. And we want to make sure the resolution is good for everyone to see. But you know, certainly there's an opportunity to display things, display maps, display different options, different scenarios for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, committee member Spadola. Uh, committee member Darby, did you have your hand raised again? No, sorry, President. Um, I'll ask my questions later. Okay, council member uh, Fields. Yes, um, thank you, Council President. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. So you're saying that this map will be um, interactive. Um, will it be interactive just for the committee members or will it be interactive for the entire council body? Well, I think um, from what I heard earlier, um, the, any materials will be posted, I think, for the whole council or on the, on the, the council's website. So I think... Um, the maps themselves would be that the actual software is not something that's live, you know, that's live, that's available to be put online just because of the, the credentials and the licensing for it. It has to be operated by someone. So it would have to be operated like in a setting, like a meeting, you know, it wouldn't uh, be a directly accessible on a website, for example. Follow up council president. Yes. Okay, so let me just make sure I'm, I'm just going to make this in layman terms. So you're saying in order for, um, say, if I wanted to see what my district would look like with the different mm -hmm. numbers, so on and so forth, we would have to have a whole meeting with everyone um, in order for you to do the map, the interactive map. Is that correct? Um, well, no, I don't know that it has to be a meeting. I think it, I would defer to the the chair on that, how he would want to handle that. It, you know, certainly we could work with, like you say, work with you or work with other council members. Um, as I mentioned earlier, coordinating it is ideal just from an efficiency standpoint. But, mm -hmm. you know, however, the committee decides, you know, that if, it, if, the, if the president is, you know, the chair rather, and the president is okay with you, uh, council members interacting with us, contacting us individually, that's fine. You know, again, totally up, up, up to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Michelle Bassanite, please. Yeah, and I, I just, just want to echo that, um, like all the requests that you have, I mean, for the committee, um, myself and Daniel, you know, um, would be like the vehicle to get the information from um, the, the um, Department of Elections. So it's just not for the um, redistricting committee members, but also as the, um, the president mentioned earlier, that he wants all of, all of council to be involved in the process. So if, even if members that are not part of the committee, you know, they have suggestions. Um, yes, please feed that information. I mean, through the committee as well as use um, Daniel and I, so that we can um, work in conjunction with the um, department, um, the Department of Elections, to get the information. So um, I just wanted just to mention that. Thank you. Uh, can, uh, committee member Oliver, did you have another question? Uh, now, this is just my last statement. Um, and Anthony, you can correct me if you're wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking to someone over the Department of Election, I know people seem to panic when we hear redistricting, uh, but talking to one of your, um, your employees, um, uh, basically, if your district is not affected and your numbers are stable, it normally affects the area that is heavy, has been, a, has been heavily increased with the population and them are the numbers that we can see, which would be the four for the eight. You can look at the, the map and see where some of these areas have been heavily populated. Is that correct? The, yeah, the data that we're providing and the maps, right, that'll show the current population or the population based on the 2020 census when it was counted. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, that's correct. You know, certainly there are areas and you see this everywhere statewide, you know, areas that have growth and that maybe areas that have um, some reduction in population or very stable. So you're right. You can see, you can see that um, in the, in the materials we've provided that kind of shows you again, kind of your starting point, you know, where things are with population. Right, so maybe um, just for example, maybe the third district, I mean, I do, um, I'm gonna speak on this when the gentleman come in for Gander Hill, but I do have Gander Hill, but some areas may just be, uh, just may be tapped just a little, but some areas may not even be tapped at all because it may not even be necessary, is that correct? Um, well, yeah, again, yeah, depending on how you, how you and your fellow committee members decide, yeah, you basically, however you uh, arrive at that goal, uh, ideally, you know, um, as close as you can, you know, to that ideal population within the permitted deviation by the city code. Sure, you know, right. And, and again, that that's kind of the ultimate goal, really, um, in addition to keeping, um, again, all those kind of best practices of district size, shape, you know, t composition, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And you're balancing a number of things. I realize it's a, it's a challenging task for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Thank you. I just said um, I could tell some people are getting nervous, or we think that oh, you hear redistrict and then you panic. And it, um, to my understanding, talking to your staff, it's not always the case. But thank you. Well, thank you, Councilwoman McCoy. Well, thank you, Chair. Uh, so this is basically a follow up of uh, Councilwoman Oliver. I, I understand exactly what she's stating, but I guess it mostly would depend on the districts that actually need to make movement because it would be the the, uh, the districts that actually uh, border that district will also would have to probably make moves in order to accommodate any type of shift. So it still is going to affect others, even if your numbers probably don't look that different. I'm okay, sorry, I just you. wanted, I just made that statement because I'm like, that's the way that I was thinking of it as they were speaking. Okay, thank you, Councilwoman. Mr. Ramos or Mr. Albans, did you have any, any other closing comments? Um, no, I, I, I certainly don't. I just want to thank the committee for uh, inviting us tonight. And again, if it's your pleasure to work with us, we'll be happy to provide any support we can and, and uh, do our best to assist you in the process. All right, thank you. Just before uh, you sign off, we do have questions from committee member Harley. Sure. Uh, so thank you, Mr. President. My my hand raises more a comment um, than anything. Um, my questions that I had earlier were primarily to confirm exactly what your office can provide, you know, and what, you know, you do and what you have done. So you definitely gave me clarity um, because that's one of the purposes of you being on this call is to let us know, you know, how you can support what y'all do and what you don't do. So um, that was great. Um, 
um, before I got on the call, I had already did all the numbers for all the districts <laughs> mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, which ones, you know, grew, which ones, you know, lost um, um, residents, et cetera, et cetera. And it definitely is almost like a matrix um, when you think about it, because, you, you know, all the bordering um, districts, because every district have at least two or three other districts that they border. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I think it's going to be a, a very good learning experience. And I really do appreciate um, what y'all have put together. And I am looking forward to us working together and getting this work done. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. It's our pleasure. And we will remain, um, I'll certainly be on the line, you know, for the, for the meeting. So certainly if anything else comes up, I can uh, be, I'll be available. Thank you. Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you both. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, at this time, we are going to uh, switch to order around just to accommodate uh, the next presenter that has to leave uh, by six. So at this time, we will have a uh, presentation by Kara Hoffner from the League of Women Voters. Hi, thank you. Can I, can I, oh, you got my screen. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Kira Hoffner. Uh, I'm with the League of Women Voters. And in 2019, we, powered, uh, we partnered with People Powered Fair Maps. Next slide. Um, one of our jobs uh, partnering, partnering with People Powered Fair Maps was to gain some partners in the state to redistrict the entire state, House and Senate districts. As you could see, some uh, um, a lot of the grassroots and bigger nonprofits have teamed up with us and we've been moving forward. Next slide. Okay, so a little background. The League of Women Voters wants to improve and protect and influence the redistricting process. Obviously, we only do this every 10 years, so there are a lot of missing pieces in this part. We never remember what everyone did 10 years ago because there was no roadmap into redistricting. And as time goes on, we get more uh, different legislative officials into the seat. So we really wanna create a state-based campaign to influence and engage, educate members of the public, community partners, lawmakers, and the media in creating fair maps. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll skip this slide as uh, it seems that everyone understands what redist the redistricting process is. So the League of Women Voters People Powered Fair Map project goals is to establish knowledge around Delawareans. A lot of Delawareans right now don't even understand why the process of redistricting happens. Uh, the League of Women Voters would like to educate them and let them know that their voice matters in this process. Um, we want to make sure that the process is done fairly and not to uh, favor one political party or person. So we're going to institute a, a roadmap for the future. So in 2030, this won't have to happen again. Next slide, please. Redistricting, why is redistricting important? Everyone you talk to, you should ask them, why is redistricting important to them? Well, this is how the, the lawns, lines are very powerful and they decide how people's voices are heard, empowered, or just being diluted by the legislators drawing their own lines. So this is why it's important that the public gets involved. Next slide, please. Okay, so gerrymandering. Uh, a lot of people don't understand where gerrymandering came from, but it, it, it's back from 18 and 12. Um, we got the name uh, by Eldred Jerry. He decided he wanted a, a district just for him and he drew the lines and it looked like a salamander. So they came up with ger gerrymandering. So it's, he just needed to manipulate the district. So it, it, it definitely was... Uh, benefiting his political party and himself, actually, or a group of people that he was working with. Next slide. Okay, packing and cracking. This is probably the most important part of, of Wilmington's uh, council that you really want to pay attention to, because in both cases, you could dilute people's voices. When you pack pe a minority group into one section, you're only giving them one uh, legislative representative down at legislative hall or in Congress if you're doing federal. Uh, we're lucky to, well, not lucky, but we only have one House representative in Congress, so we don't have to do appropriations. We want to make sure that these lines are drawn fairly. Cracking also 
will separate minority groups into so many different districts, it just totally dilutes their voice and ma makes the, their issues irrelevant to the legislators. Next slide, please. Transparency. I really enjoyed that you guys talked a lot about transparency. Transparency is gonna get the public knowledgeable about why redistricting happens. It will not, you will never be accused of um, doing lines to create your own political interests. So an open and transparent redistricting process can help ensure the public servants are elected to serve the citizens, not having an elected official pick their voters. So that's really important that you just want to constantly keep the uh, public engaged. Um, I'm, I'm really excited that you kept bringing that up in, in your presentation before. Next slide, please. All right, communities of interest. Communities of interest are not always looked at. In the past, they, they obviously some of you have been around for a few redistricting cycles. We didn't really take communities of interest into an account. So what we wanna do is make sure these communities of interest are staying together. One of the roads that we use is 95. Um, when I started this back in 2019, you know, you, you go around and you believe that uh, boundaries have to be major roads, uh, landmarks, uh, natural parks. But when we get to Wilmington and 95, the community goes under and over 95. So we really don't wanna use 95 as a divider of our communities of interest. And we wanna make sure that our communities of interest actually have something in common. You could have one city, di uh, city district in Wilmington, but have two different communities of interest within that district. So keeping your numbers up, uh, uh, keeping the deviation uh, uh, around the same number so that I'm, get, I'm getting a little confused as I keep seeing a different screen pop up. <laughs> um, sorry about that. So we, we just wanna get, make sure we keep our communities that have social, social cultural, ethnic, economic, and religious, and even political views the same together. Next slide, please. So what the League of Women Voters is doing is to help ensure that we're keeping communities of interest together up and down the state is we're using a program called Representable. The president gerrymandering team came up with this program and we can call them in if your, your group wants um, a presentation on how to use it. So you can collect communities of interest from everyone in your neighborhood without them having to come and sit with you and talk to you about, okay, this block is in there. They could actually do it in the program themselves. They could draw a little map around their community. It can be three houses or it could be 500 people that's in their community of interest. Now you could also take that community of interest that they just drew you and upload it into Maptitude and you will see their community of interest and know not to draw a line through it. You could also ask people to use Dave's redistricting app if they're comfortable drawing maps they could use Dave's redistricting app to draw a larger uh, district. And that also can be uploaded into Maptitude. Um, but the problem with uh, Representable and Dave's redistricting app is it doesn't get down to the smallest census block. It only does census groups. So it's a little bit bigger than what you would normally uh, wanna use. But you just really wanna get an idea of where these communities of interest are that we don't wanna draw a line through. Next slide, please. Um, so our expected outcomes is the League of Women Voters with their partners will be drawing fair maps for the Delaware House and Senate. Um, Broad-based advocacy for fair maps. Our final project uh, will definitely be publicized and for everyone to see. Um, we will be presenting these maps and we also wanna create the, the history of how we got here and why we don't have a uh, independent commission and creating best practices on how to redistrict will help our final outcomes. Um, next slide. Okay, so you can connect with us on our Facebook page. Our leak site has many different um, information to help you understand the difference of racial uh, gerrymandering, buddy mandering, and, and just 
a lot of information that we've collected over the last couple of years. Uh, you could email me personally. We do own the uh, software program, uh, Maptitude. So we are willing, we have the program until February of 2022. So we're gonna be done with the program on, by November 7th. That is when the state house and Senate districts will be drawn. We are here to help you guys. If you wanna use the, our program, Anthony obviously is willing to have you use the program also. So that, that will definitely help. We're all here to help you. Um, next slide. Mm -hmm. And thank you for having me come speak tonight. Rachel, gerrymandering is the intentional manipula manipulation of the redistricting process by the people in political power to reduce the political power of certain racial groups. We need to remember that uh, when the state is drawing the maps, they're um, sometimes protecting the incumbents and we wanna get away from that. Um, by having somebody independent drawing the maps. Um, does anyone have any questions or? Yes, I, I have a question. Sure. So just on your, on your last point, well, first I wanna thank you for joining us this evening. I know that you are under a time constraint. <laughs> um, just on your, your last point you just made that uh, some people in political positions will um, draw maps to protect incumbents. So mm -hmm. if, if you see that, if you think that that is occurring, what will you, your organization do as a, as, a, or like as a group? Well, the League of Women Voters um, is not in the position to litigate. Uh, we have talked to other partners uh, about it and we will have to make that decision once the maps come out. Right now, it, we're in such a holding pattern until the maps actually come out. We can guess what they're gonna do this time, but we don't have a crystal ball. We hope that they're not going around asking incumbents their addresses and drawing maps around it. But once we see the final maps that they're proposing compared to the final maps that we propose, that's when we'll know if buddy mandering happens. Okay. All right, thank you. Do it. Any other committee members or council members have any questions for Ms. Hawthorne, before she goes. Uh, Committee Member Harley. Oh, yes. Um, I, I just want to thank her for um, coming and sharing her information on tonight. And um, I just would like to make sure that we have the contact information because it sounds like with this project, there are a number of organizations like um, this particular one that can be a resource as well. So. I really um, appreciate the information she shared today and I wanted to make sure that we have her information. That's all I have. Um, yes, I, I, I have shared it with Marcel and I, I could also put it in the chat box if anybody needs it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, we'd appreciate it if you are also able to put it in the chat box. All right, thank you again, Ms. Hoffner. Thank you, have a good night. Okay, you too. This time, next on the agenda will be a summary of the Voters Right Acts, uh, uh, Voters Right Acts by Zach Staparo, Assistant City Solicitor of the, from our Law Department. Good evening, City Council President and Committee City Council Members, City Council Members generally and the public. My name is Zach Staparo and I work in the City's Law Department. I have been asked to briefly summarize the Voting Rights Act of 1965 for this committee. The city solicitor has reviewed the summary and would like me to reiterate that this is merely a summation of current precedent and history and is not legal advice. The 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution enshrines in law that the right of a U.S. citizen to vote shall not be denied or curtailed because of that citizen's race or skin color. As powerfully phrased by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1964, quote, the right to vote freely for the candidate of one's choice is of the essence of a democratic society. And any restrictions on that right strike at the heart of representative government. The concept of we the people under the constitution visualizes no preferred class of voters, but equality, end quote. Accordingly, the U.S. Supreme Court has stated that quote, 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause requires states to make an honest and good faith effort to construct legislative districts 
as nearly of equal population as is practical, end quote. Motivated to act by the civil rights movement to address decades of disenfranchisement of minority voters and enforce the 15th Amendment, Congress enacted the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The act prohibits federal, state, or local governments from discriminating against citizens on the basis of the race or skin color by requiring the citizen to meet overly burdensome and vague qualifications in order to vote. In 1966, the U.S. Supreme Court described Congress's efforts to pass the act as follows, quote, the House and Senate committees on the judiciary each held hearings for nine days and received testimony from a total of 67 witnesses. More than three full days were consumed discussing the bill on the floor of the House, while the debate in the Senate covered 26 days in all. At the close of those deliberations, the verdict of both chambers was overwhelming. The House approved the bill by a vote of 328 to 74, and the measure passed the Senate by a margin of 79 to 18. One year after the act was passed, provisions were challenged by South Carolina. And in South Carolina versus Katzenbach, the US Supreme Court upheld the act as constitutional, consistent with the 15th Amendment. An important piece of the act is section two, also known as 52 USC section 10301. Section two is similar to the language of the 15th Amendment and it states, quote, no voting qualification or prerequisite to voting or standard practice or procedure shall be imposed or applied by any state or political subdivision in a manner which results in a denial or abridgment of the right of any citizen of the United States to vote on account of race or skin color. In 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court curtailed the act by finding that Section 2 did not impose an easier burden on the plaintiff than the 15th Amendment and required claims of minority delusion to also prove the voting restriction was passed for a racially discriminatory purpose. Now, in response to the Supreme Court, Congress amended Section 2 in 1982 and expressly clarified that the plaintiff did not need to prove the voting restriction was enacted with discriminatory purpose. Thankfully, in 1991, the Supreme Court acknowledged Congress's change to Section 2 when the court held that Section 2 differs from the 15th Amendment and does not require the plaintiff prove both discriminatory purpose and discriminatory results. Instead, the plaintiff only needs to show that the voting restriction creates discriminatory results. As noted by this precedent, Section 2 is extremely important because it prevents the dilution of minority votes. That is, the act prevents governments from redistricting in such a way as to spread out minority communities into a large number of districts or concentrate the community in a small restricted district so that the votes are not as impactful. Further, on the other side of the coin, Section 2 serves the important purpose of ensuring that race is reasonably considered in redistricting. To this end, the Supreme Court has established criteria for determining whether there was voting delusion and the drawing of a majority minority district was justified. So that concludes my brief background on the act. I hope it's been helpful um, and illuminating. It is, I believe, uh, it is on the website for you to read the comments. I have sources um, in the written dialogue if anyone is interested to kind of see the history on this. All right, thank you, uh, Zach, for your presentation. I don't see any hands raised from any council or committee members. Just wanna make sure I'm not passing anybody up. All right, thank you again. And as, as was mentioned earlier, uh, your presentation is also a part of our packet uh, that council and committee members will receive. At this time, we're going to have a presentation um, of SB 171, the incarceration um, prison inmates by John Sebastian, Deputy um, Chief of the Department of Corrections. Good evening, President Congo and members of the redistricting committee. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. 
My name is John Sebastian, and I'm the Deputy Chief of Administrative Services for the Department of Correction. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today on behalf of the Department of Correction regarding Senate Bill 171 and the counting of inmates for the 2020 Federal Decennial Census. Upon enactment, SB 171 will require the Department of Correction to provide last known residence information of incarcerated individuals in state correctional facilities to the Department of Elections by September 15th of the year of the Federal Decennial Census. This is not a big change for the Department of Correction as we regularly report this information. The Department of Correction is considered a group quarters by the United States Census Bureau. Group quarters are defined as places where people live or stay in a group living arrangement that is owned or managed by an entity or organization providing housing and or services for the residents. For the 2020 census, the US Census Bureau provided and required the Department of Correction to use a specific template for reporting individuals in our custody. This format included the actual group quarters address where the inmates stay or live and an alternate address. The alternate address is the last known address of where the person lives or stays when not at the facility as the inmate reports upon their intake to our facilities. For the 2020 US Census, the DOC took a snapshot of our inmate population on census day which was April 1st, 2020. For that enumeration, the DOC only included individuals in our facilities on April 1st. The Delaware Department of Correction does not report the number of inmates in federal prisons or the number of Delaware inmates housed in other states. The Federal Bureau of Prisons and other states report the number of inmates in their custody to the US Census Bureau. The Delaware Department of Correction completed our group quarters e-response submission to the US Census on May 1st, 2020. The DOC reported the number of incarcerated individuals from eight of our facilities. This included the Howard R. Young Correctional Institution, Baylor Women's Correctional Institution, James T. Vaughn Correctional Center, Sussex Correctional Institution, Plummer Community Correction Center, Hazel D. Plant Women's Treatment Facility, Morris Community Correction Center, and Sussex Community Correction Center. The DOC then shared the 2020 U.S. Census data with the Department of Elections on May 5th, 2021, using the format required by the U.S. Census. This data was sent by the DOC Director of Information and Technology to the Department of Elections Director of Information Technology. Hopefully this answers some of the questions that the committee members may have, and I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you. Please let me know if any questions come up. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sebastian. We do have a, a question from committee member Oliver. Committee, committee member Oliver, did you have a question? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't take my um, my mute off, I'm sorry. Um, thank you, uh, Commissioner um, Shabafi. Uh, just for clarity, House Bill 171, so it states uh, um, in reference to individuals incarcerated, the last address. So could you give me the number of incarcerated um, uh, inmates you have again to heal currently? Roughly. So as of today, we have a total of 1,178 inmates in Ginner Hill. And may I follow up, Mr. President? <clears throat> yes, you may. And as a follow up, how many of the inmates, which you say roughly, um, have addresses uh, from women to Delaware? That I would have to get back to you on. I okay. So, okay, I would, um, I would like to have that information because based on that bill, um, from my understanding, if it's saying um, I'm only counting the, the number of individuals who have addresses, their last, their last reported address. So if you have 1,100 inmates over there, I mean, it could be 800 or 600 of them from out of state. So 
So I just would like to know the end state. And I uh, guess I'm also trying to figure out, I mean, I guess the end state was started, but the last given address, they may be from Smyrna just because they live in, in, um, in Wilmington doesn't necessarily, uh, they don't have to live in the city of Wilmington, they can live in Newcastle. So um, we could talk offline, I could shoot your email. I'm just trying to figure that out because that would also help out um, me working with the map because it's the, the thousand other inmates, they're all not from Wilmington and their last address could be from anywhere. So to my understanding, it may just be on, um, I think they said it's only about 300 of them um, from Wilmington. And I might just have a hundred that lives in the third district. So it's because they're from Wilmington don't even necessarily mean, but Gander Hill is in the third district. So that's where um, I'm being slighted. You understand where I'm coming from? So just to clarify, the Department of Correction, we simply report the address, which is the, the more or less the mailing address of the offenders in our custody. The Department of Elections then is responsible for geocoding those addresses to see where they fit into specific districts or cities, wherever that may be. So Commissioner Albans, he would be better to speak to that because we simply report the address. We don't geocode them and say you know, that a, a, a Wilmington address is truly within the city of Wilmington. No, I understand that. Um, okay, so no, I'm with you. I'm just saying, am I clear on that act that you're just reporting the last a mailing address of the inmate? Is that correct? Yes, and so, and as you said, we may have inmates that are in Sussex Correctional Institution that reported a Wilmington address. Right. Just as we may have someone at Howard R. Young that reports a Georgetown address. And right. that, that information was all provided to, to the Department of Elections. Okay, I'll follow up with our chief of staff. Thank you. I just wanted to make some clarity on it. Thank you. Not a problem. Okay, uh, Marshall Bass Knight, please. Yes, I just want to um, add on to what Councilwoman Oliver was saying too. I just want to mention um, the chart that was provided that talks about um, the population and um, the total that's within each district. That far left-hand corner um, column is titled um, incarcerated. And it's my understanding um, that the numbers that Mr. Sebastian was referring to, that was the information that was shared with the um, Department of Elections for geocoding. Um, those are where those numbers are listed per district. Um, so I just wanted to share with um, the committee as well as um, the public is when they look at that particular um, chart, that last column, um, that is very critical when it comes to um, the incarcerated because it is not factored in the total. But to answer some of Councilwoman Oliver's questions, those numbers are there. And I just have one question for Mr. Sebastian because I just wanna make sure that um, um, I, um, interpret you correctly is for federal prisons and other prisons that are not in um, the state of Delaware that have residents of the city of Wilmington, those numbers are not factored in the census data. Is that correct or not? They are not factored in the data that we provided. So whether the Department of Elections then received information from the Federal Bureau of Prisons for Delaware residents that are in their custody, I would not know that. Um, Mr. Owens would be um, better to speak to that. Just as um, inmates that are serving sentence or um, staying in other state facilities outside of Delaware, we do not report that either. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Committee member Mashima Dixon. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I did want to um, just off of the um, comment that uh, Councilwoman Oliver was asking, I did want to say that I just I did a quick adding up real quick on a, a scale and it's uh, 917 um, that are in the city of Wilmington that has addresses uh, that are based on the list. And um, you have 183 of them, Councilwoman Oliver, um, based on the list. Um, and also just had a question, um, Commissioner, if there are um, 
I know you said you don't account for the individuals who are not, who are out of state. Um, you don't count for those. Um, if they do come back into the state, and you come back into the state at some point, is that number changed or does it remain the same until the next census? No, that number would remain the same. The, the census data that was captured and reported is the count of offenders and specific offenders that were in our custody on April 1st, 2020. So that is a static number, even though our population changes day to day. Like the right. pre previous question was how many are in our facility today at Gander Hill? I think I, I said, uh, let's see, 1,178 on census day, we had 1,281. So mm -hmm. the difference, you know, versus today versus what was reported then, you know, our population has shrunk in our facilities. Okay, I guess in some cases that's a good thing. So you want them to shrink. So, um, but thank you for answering my question. No problem. Okay, thank you. I do see um, Anthony Alvin's uh, hands, his hand raised from the state election department. <laughs> Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick note, I just wanted to um, follow up real briefly on something uh, that Mr. Sebastian mentioned. The uh, the data that was provided that Marshall read out, um, that is all based on uh, the State Department of Correction uh, data was provided. We don't receive or have, ha we do not receive any additional info like from the Federal Bureau of Prisons or anything like that. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, committee member Harley. Yes, uh, Mr. President. Um, as it relates to the our incarcerated numbers, and um, we did get that spreadsheet that shows the numbers, um, and I heard it mentioned several times that those numbers are not included. Like, what does that mean? Um, they're not included. Are they included, or at what point will they be included? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure who I should direct that question to. Um. I believe that Marcelle said that she will uh, she will answer that question. Yes. So, um, Councilman Harley. Um, so the next time we meet, we will update um, this chart because we just received this. Um, we just received the data today. So the total population of the seventy thousand eight hundred ninety eight, and then there's in addition to that, there are a total of nine hundred and seventeen prison inmates. So we need to add, take the nine hundred seventeen to add to the seventy thousand eight hundred ninety eight, and then determine what the ideal district is. So we'll have that updated for you as well for this for the committee council and the public to review that. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Committee member Oliver. Thank you. Um, just wanted to make two comments. I'm glad Anthony clarified that. So um, with Anthony's statement, will um, the commissioner be able to um, address that because Anthony contradict what the commissioner just said. So how's, how does that uh, clarify commissioner? Cause he said they don't receive the federal data and you just said Anthony and them had that data. And he said he wanted to make uh, clear on that, that he does it. So who has that data? And one other statement um, with Councilman Dixon, um, the 183 is on the map. I was just trying to make a point because I could see how many is over there. It's 183 of the map they put up. But my point, um, but I'm glad you brought that up. My point uh, with the 1,281, he stated, the commissioner stated, and you said, well, that's a good thing. That's nowhere uh, good to me to hear that. It's only 181. This is not the time for that, but uh, that's definitely not enough people released from incarceration for um, small census acts. But I would just like to know um, who, who can clarify that, Anthony. I mean, would the commissioner clarify who has that information? Because Anthony just said they don't have it. So from a Department of Correction standpoint, we only report who is in our custody, who is in our facilities on census day. So... I wasn't sure if the Department of Elections received data from other states or the Federal Bureau of uh, Prisons. That's why I referred to him. If they have not received it, then it's not going to be in the counts. Anthony, excuse me, Mr. President, um, may I follow up? Yes, you may. So Anthony, where does that come in account? Because that's a big gap. So where does that come in account? 
Um, well, Mr. President, on that question, we, you know, in our role in elections, we've actually never received that information. Um, and in fact, um, of wow. course, this is the first time, well, of course, this SB 171 was just recently enacted. So this is actually the first time we've even done this, that both of our departments, I should say, have cooperated in, re in regards to those incarcerated at state facilities. That was not done pri previously either in this regard, in terms of coding those individuals to their last known address. But in my experience, we've never received any information from on federal, those incarcerated in federal institutions in the past. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do any other committee members or council members have any questions? Oh, I just want to, uh, to thank you, Mr. Sebastian, for your uh, presentation this evening. Thank you, President Tiger. Well, you're welcome. At this time, I'm going to, we're going to go to, uh, to other business and I'm going to start off with uh, Marshall Bass Knight. Um, yes, for the next meeting that's coming up, it would be on um, September the 23rd. And um, at that particular meeting, we're gonna look more at the data as well as the maps so uh, we will be reaching out to um, the um, committee members as well as council members. If you have some um, scenarios, um, Daniel and, and, and or I would like to be able to um, get the information to work with um, the um, Department of Elections so that we can have something um, prepared um, for that meeting. But most importantly, at the next meeting, we'd like to really start to look at the maps and, and to look at the data. Okay, thank you. And before we go to public comment, I just want to see if any uh, committee members or council members have any other statements or questions. Okay, if, if, if not, I believe that I do see uh, one person has their hand raised uh, virtually and we do have two people from the public in chambers I'm not sure if they have signed up to speak or if they want to speak or give any public comment. But first, uh, we will go to, and please forgive me for if I mispronounce your name, Alex Kastura. That's pretty close, thanks. Uh, so my name is Alex Kastura. I'm the legal director okay. of the Prison Policy Initiative, and we focus on how incarcerated people are counted in the census and how the data is used for redistricting. So. I'm kind of hoping to clarify a couple of the points I think that have been tripping folks up a little bit. Um, and that's what data is actually included um, in that blue chart that you guys were looking at. Um, the column at the end that everybody's talking about, that's folks who are incarcerated throughout the state, which district they come from. But when, um, when y'all were saying how the incarcerated people aren't included in the data in the rest of the chart, that's I think where the, some of the confusion comes from because the folks who are incarcerated at um, the Howard Young facility, no matter where they came from, are, are included in that chart. Because the total population that you're looking at at the bottom, the um, 70,898, that includes 1,424 incarcerated people. And some of those are counted, um, 1,281 were counted at Howard Young and others were counted, I think, in the jail. So you're kind of looking at a couple different kinds of data all together. So I think um, if you're going to be counting people at home, you should take the folks that are counted at the Howard Young facility that the census counted there um, as the um, deputy um, chief explained, they give all that data, just their current populations to the census and the census just spit it back to you guys. So if you're going to count everybody back in the district they came from, you'll also need to subtract that data out of the census chart there. And yeah, that was just a point of clarification. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to talk now or you know, take questions by email later. Okay, thank you very much. We appreciate that. I do 
believe we have a question or comment from committee member Harley. Okay, so um, thank you um, for sharing that information. So the way I interpreted what was just said is that this, the 7898, those numbers um, under un incarcerated are already dialed into the 70898. That's the way I interpret what was just said. Is that correct, ma'am? The 7898 includes people who were incarcerated in a facility that's located in Wilmington, no matter where they came from. It does not include anybody who is from Wilmington that is incarcerated elsewhere. Okay, okay. A follow-up? Yes. Okay. So, okay, I'm going to um, hold my question and I will um, come back later. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Committee member Oliver. Yes, Mr. President, I was just going to ask Alice, could she just put her information or submit her information because never known as the debate of just a public comment. I just thought that's uh, what it is, but I was just wondering if she could put her information up so we could follow up off the record, that's all. I'd be okay. happy to share my info. Um, the chat's been disabled. So um, yeah, just let me know how the best way to share it is and I'll send it that way. I think Marcel's down in the chambers, right? Yes, you, you said the chat was disabled. Oh, now it's now I see it again. Okay. Oh uh, yeah, if you can put your information right in the chat, please. I'm Michelle. Yes. Um, I'd like to say thanks, Alex, for her comments. But um, if Anthony, if you're still on, if you can, um, you know, share some insight into what Alex just shared. Um, so we have some um, clarity regarding that the, the last column, as well as the total for the 70,898, um, because it was shared that the numbers in that last column is not part of it. So I just want to make sure we have, I mean, clarity on that or we can talk offside. Oh, sure. I, I'll just do my best to answer that question. Okay. Um, if I uh, Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and thank you, Marshall. Um, basically that information that provided on the chart outside of the column for those incarcerated, that's individual, that's information directly from the census. So that's information directly from the census as reported and as uh, we interpreted or ingested, I should say, into map to two to put into the into the correspond to the districts. Um, so that's just straight info from the census that, that we get from them. We don't analyze what constitutes that data ourselves. So we just get that directly from the U.S. Census um, and put that in. And the list at the column at the end, again, that like, as you mentioned, that's all based on those incarcerated in the state that I know that info was requested. Um, and I know um, the original uh, understanding of, of the of Senate Bill 171 was the the sharing of that data was ultimately to the General Assembly. That's how that was how that was originally phrased for their redistricting. But I know uh, that info was requested, which is why we provided it. But again, yeah, we when we get the info from the census, that's just the, the, the straight data, the raw data that that the census provides to us. And that's their, their accounts as they present them to us. So um, we, we don't go any deeper in terms of analyzing it because that's just what we are concerned about is just the data at the top level like the actual accounts. So, um, so that might be a question to explore you know, offline um, on that as well. Just, but that's just to clarify where that data comes from. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, are there any other members from the public who would like to uh, comment or have any questions? Anyone else from the, uh, the committee or from council? I don't see any hands raised. So I just want to uh, thank everyone from, from the committee and from council and all of our participants for uh, helping us with this first meeting, as Marshall mentioned, um, 
our next meeting will be on September the 23rd. I also want to want to thank everyone from the public who joined us virtually and in council chambers. Want to encourage you to con uh, continue to do so. Please come down to chambers or if you're more comfortable um, joining us virtually. Uh, just please be a part of this process. We want to make it extremely transparent and we uh, want your feedback. If you have any question, if you have any uh, questions or uh, for any of, of us from council or on the committee or any of the, pre on the presenters, you can call us at 576-2140. Your number is 302-576-2140. Or you can always go to our website at www.wilmingtoncitycouncil.com. And for that, I will take a, uh, I will accept a motion to adjourn. Second. So moved. This will probably move in second to adjourn. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.